Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last talk of this session. Uh, and now we're going to have Gilad Oshav, who's a, an assistant professor here at Bar Ilan University. He did his PhD also here at Bar Ilan as a student of, uh, of Yuda Linden. And then he went on to be a postdoc at uh, Cornell Tech and IBM Research uh, in New York. And he was also the vice president and cryptography research lead at JP Morgan. So Gilad's research focuses on secure uh, computation, both theory and practice, on the interplay between cryptography and complexity and on oblivious computation, which is what he's going to tell us about today and tomorrow. So specifically, he'll talk about recent advances in oblivious RAM. So we have one hour today and two tomorrow morning. So Gilad, you can start. Thank you so much and thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about oblivious computation. Um, I have total three hours. Today I'm going to talk about lower bound and one technique for, uh, for uh, oblivious computation. Tomorrow we're going to focus on uh, the other technique, which is hierarchical uh, aura. Um, some of the slides today I took from Elaine Shi and uh, Elon Komorgotsky, so um, I want to give them the credit. Okay, so let's start. Um, when we all studied models of computation, we talked about Turing machines and uh, final automata. And two models that are widely used in the real world are circuits and RAM in the RAM model. In circuits, we all know we have some gates, we have uh, wires. And if we talk about Boolean circuit, then each wire can carry, carry a bit. And the gates could be, I don't know, and or XOR and so on. In the RAM model, we have a CPU and the memory, and the CPU performs some operation. It can uh, read, it can, uh, I don't know, add to the value of two registers that it has, or uh, multiply them. And then after it performs some computation, it goes to the memory and can write down something or read some information to the memory. And it talks, it provides information to the memory and, and reads information from the memory into his own register. And uh, this goes in cycles, continues um, for, uh, for a long period of time. So uh, we can translate a RAM program into circuits and circuits into RAM program. Emulate and circuit computation of circuits and RAM program is very easy. And the metrics are quite different also between those two uh, models of computation. In circuits, we care about the size of the circuit, how many gates, how many wires, and, and also we care about the depth, how much parallelism we have in the circuit. When we talk about RAM program, we, call about, we, we care about the time, how many steps we have to do, and the size of the memory, which is, uh, we're going to denote it by capital N throughout the talks. Now, um, I wanna, we want to look at the case where the CPU is uh, is trusted, but the memory is untrusted. Okay, so you can assume that the adversary can actually view the memory. So you can say, okay, what's the problem? Let's encrypt all the data whenever I'm kind. I'm come to um, write something to the memory or read something from the memory. We just use encryption, and everything is good. But it turns out that there is uh, a leakage in the form of an access pattern that uh, it's very, uh, it leaks a lot of information and it leaks a lot about our computation. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, what is this program? This is binary search. Okay, we have a vector of values, some starting point and uh, start and, and end. I'm gonna compute the middle and then I'm going to search to the value that I'm looking for. Okay, value is the value that I'm looking for. Mem is the memory. I'm looking for some specific, specific value, specific key in the memory. Uh, and this is a, a binary search that we are familiar with. And if we look at the access pattern, what we are going to access, the access pattern in binary search leaks exactly the rank of the number or the value that we are actually accessing. Okay, so the fact that I'm first going to the middle, and then if I'm going to the left-hand side or the right-hand side, this reveals information about the rank of the values that I'm accessing. 
If I have uh, the following lines in, in my code, uh, if I have some secret variable, and according to that secret value variable, I'm either going to access some value X, some memory location X, or memory location Y, uh, the secret variable, if I'm going to, to access X or Y, will actually reveal the value of that secret variable that we don't want to reveal. And uh, this is uh, also interesting in, in the case of uh, cloud computing. So think that you have some program and you upload information to the cloud, even though the information is encrypted, where I am accessing, what exactly the values, the locations, the memory locations that I'm accessing reveal sensitive information. Let's look at one example. Let's say that we have a doctor, that a medical doctor, that uploads all the genomic information of its client to the cloud. Now, suppose that the doctor always accesses regions that relate to the kidney and not, let's say, to the liver or the heart. So even though the data is encrypted, the server that sees where the client is accessing can infer that the patient has some kidney problem and not, say, uh, a heart problem. OK? So this brings us so, to introduce a new or another model of computation, which is going to call it oblivious RAM model. Uh, by oblivious, I mean that the access pattern, uh, so this is like a RAM model, but the access pattern can be simulated. It doesn't leak any information about what the program actually accesses. Okay, so we can access, we can simulate uh, the access pattern from the total steps that the program uh, makes and the size of the memory. Okay, let's look at an example. So let's look at uh, sorting. Uh, let's look at merge sort. So merge sort of, uh, let's look at, you know, during merge sort, we're going to merge two sorted arrays. Let's think that the arrays are one, two, three, and, and the other array is four, five, six. Okay, so the way it's going to work, I'm going to compare one and four going to see that one is the minimum. Then I'm going to compute to, to compare two and four. I'm going to write down two. And then three and four, I'm going to write down three. And then I'm going to continue with four, five, and six. On the other end, if I want to uh, do merge of another way, which is one, three, and five, and two, four, and six, then I'm going to compare one and two. I'm going to, uh, to write down one, increment this one. Then I'm going to compare three and two, I'm gonna take two. And you see like uh, the, the access pattern between those two merges is completely different. So from the access pattern, I can infer and learn what is the internal rank between the two arrays that I'm merging. So merge sort is not oblivious. On the other end, if I'm looking at bubble sort, then it doesn't matter what input I have, the bubble sort, the access pattern is the same. So let's say I'm running bubble sort on one, two, three, and four. I'm going to compare one and two, leave them the same, and then two and three, leave them the same, three and three, three and four. I'm not going to swap anything. On the other end, if I'm, I have four, three, two, and one, I'm going to compare four and three. I'm going to see the three is smaller. I'm going to write them down, but I'm accessing exactly the same location. So it doesn't matter what the input is, the access pattern of bubble sort is exactly the same. And you can actually simulate the access pattern. You can say, I need to write those two and then those two and so on. Okay, so uh, bubble sort is oblivious. So um, now, of course, when we know that we have raw model, we have programs in the raw model, and we have programs in what we call oblivious RAM model. A natural question is whether we can take any program in the RAM model and convert it into a program in the oblivious RAM model. Okay, so we want to have a sort of a compiler to take the RAM, a RAM machine and convert it to an oblivious RAM machine. In terms of uh, feasibility, okay, so the question is, of course, what is the overhead? So we have a RAM program that runs in T steps and uses memory of size N. I wanna look an oblivious RAM program 
that computes the same function and will take now t, t prime steps and maybe use some more memory, some larger memory. So we're gonna call it n prime. Now the question is whether always we can do that, whether there is actually such a compiler. And the question is, if there is such a compiler, what is the overhead? How much we blow up our computation? Of course, there is always such a compiler. We all know that um, if ever, at any time I want to access the memory, I'm just gonna uh, scan the entire memory, gonna over the entire memory, then it's going to blow up the computation by a factor of n. So if I have a program that runs in, in t steps, it's going to end up with a program that runs in t times n steps. Okay, so the question is not about feasibility, we know that it's possible to convert any program to an oblivious RAM equivalent. But the question is how to do it with minimal blow up. So, or minimum overhead. So we are going to denote the overhead as T prime over T. Okay, so uh, oblivious RAM, this notion of compiling a program and making it oblivious, it's an algorithmic technique that actually probably uh, encrypts the access patterns. It was introduced by uh, Goldreich and Ostrovsky, and it goes back to 87. And um, just to write, to, to, to say it a little bit more formally, so we can look about ORAM as, uh, as a machine that's in between our client and the memory. We look at the cloud at the cloud model. And uh, the ORAM is going to receive, uh, it's going to have the same interface as the memory. So we're going to have read and write addresses. And it's going to handle the memory for the client while interacting with the external memory and not leaking information about what the client is actually accessing. So those we're gonna call them the logical addresses. This is what the program actually want to access. And each access is going to be translated to many physical operations, many physical accesses, and, um, and does what we call the physical read rights. Now security will say that the physical accesses, those do not, in, uh, are independent of the logical sequence that we have over here, and we formalize it by asking for a simulator that doesn't receive the logical addresses, doesn't receive the sequence that the client actually sent, but it can produce essentially the same memory distribution accesses, uh, physical accesses as the ORAM that does see the logical addresses. Okay. Um, and of course, as always in cryptography, when we look about two distributions, we can call about we, we can talk about perfect simulation where the simulator perfectly simulates uh, the physical uh, sequence of the ORAM. We can talk about statistical clause, and we can we can talk about computational uh, security. ORAM schemes are widely used. Uh, they're used in cloud computing, theoretical crypto, programming languages, databases, and then so more. Okay, I'm not gonna cover everything, of course, just showing this is everywhere. Okay, what about uh, ORAM? Uh, let's see um, some previous works. So ORAMs were introduced already in 87. And uh, in the, the paper, in the, the work of Goldrach and Ostrovsky, um, a framework of hierarchical ORAM was introduced that receives overhead of log cube n. And also back then we already knew that any law, any ORAM will require overhead of log n, where n is the size of the memory. In between, um, the hierarchical ORAM was improved. Those uh, overhead was reduced to log square n. And around roughly at the same time in, in 2011, uh, there was another technique for achieving ORAM that was introduced, which is tree-based ORAM. And it also started with log cube and was reduced to log square. 
this time it, it actually achieves statistical security. And uh, at this point of, of, of the research, there was a gap. We have two techniques. They both achieve log square n, while the best, or, uh, the best lower bound is actually uh, log n. So there was a gap. And this gap was uh, recently uh, matched um, by two works, uh, Panorama and Optorama. I'm going to describe tomorrow. And it's also based on the hierarchical ORAM, so it's the same uh, technique as Goldrachen and Ostrowski. It achieves log n overhead and it matches the, the lower bound. And this is in the computational security. Okay, so right now we do have a gap between statistical security and the lower bound of logging. Okay, just before I actually start to talk about the technical stuff, uh, I want to mention one more model of computation. So we, we looked at uh, the RAM model and the circuit model. The circuit model is uh, very bad if you want to uh, access a memory. You cannot, you need to like pay as the size of the memory. There's no dynamic memory access. You cannot know in, in compilation time. If you don't know in compilation time what exactly you want to access, you need to kind of copy the entire memory or pay something which is proportional to the size of the memory. But it's oblivious by design and it supports very high level of parallelism. RAM model supports very nice uh, dynamic memory accesses. You can do it in the cost of uh, one, but it's not oblivious and there is no parallelism. Oblivious RAM gives you the obliviousness. And of course, you, you need to ask, okay, what about parallelism? So there is this notion of this model of computation that is called parallel RAM model. Um, it also supports the dynamic memory accesses. It's not oblivious, it supports parallelism. And we can also talk about oblivious parallel RAM model and oblivious PRAM compilers that take a PRAM program and converts it, converts it to oblivious PRAM program. I'm not going to talk about uh, this model so much. I just want to mention that uh, there are also compilers in this, in this direction. Uh, oblivious PRAM compiler was introduced by Boyle, Chang, and Pass in 2016. And in a recent work at SODA, uh, we showed that uh, any PRAM program with T parallel time and N space, you can convert to a T log N parallel time and N space. Okay. Um, so the state of the art, as I mentioned, uh, we have a lower bound of uh, omega log N. There are two main techniques tree-based ORAM and hierarchical-based uh, ORAMs. The tree-based ORAM achieve overhead of log square n. The hierarchical construction achieves log n, okay? And what I'm gonna talk today is about the lower bound and the tree-based ORAM, and tomorrow I'm going to cover uh, the log n over. So uh, before I actually start, if there are any questions, Hey, um, so one question is that what is the difference between ORAM and PIR? Maybe yeah, yeah. In one line, um, maybe. In one line. So usually in ORAM, uh, you have one client that that um, that is the owner of the data. We can look one interpretation. We have a client that is the owner of the data. It can move the data can change things in the, in the cloud versus peer, which is maybe uh, when I'm going and query Google, it's not my data, database. I cannot really move things around. I'm not the owner of the data, but you care about my, my query. So the difference is about the client uh, has state in ORAM, whereas in peer, the client cannot really have states. This is why peer, support many clients very easily, whereas ORAM for more than one client is it's very uh, hard and difficult question. Uh, is there, yeah, is there an overhead in space as well? 
If so, by how much? So there are overheads by space. Um, some construction do have. Uh, originally, I mean, the original construction blow up from N to N log N. Um, but now we know how to do it in uh, linear, linear uh, overhead, which means that it's a constant overhead, constant quantification. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we do it in linear. Yeah, that's in a, Okay, so um, let's start. I'm going to start with the lower bound. And um, so the lower bound says that any ORM compiler results in a blow up of log n. I mean, by compiler, I mean you take a RAM program and compile it to an oblivious RAM program. So uh, the work of Goldrich and Ostrowski already showed uh, an ORM uh, showing that uh, an overhead is, an, is a log n. It's based on some counting argument that I'm not going to, to describe. And the work of um, Boyle and O revisited that, that lower bound and found out that it has, um, has the following properties, which are two are kind of an advantage, advantages, and one is, uh, is a disadvantage. So first, this lower lower bound is in what we saw, what is called, called the balls and beans model. What is the balls and beans model? So if I have my memory, then I can just read or write some objects. I can read or write some balls that um, the logical, that the program actually tried to write. Uh, I cannot like take a ball and use some encoding, divide it to different cells or do some secret sharing and so on. Okay, so I need to, to relate to each one of, of each memory block as what is so-called OPEC. It's one thing that I cannot uh, divide. And um, so this is the balls and beans model. So a natural question is maybe we can do better when we are not in the balls and beans model. And uh, another thing that uh, this low bound is in the statistical security, achieves statistical security. So maybe if you assume some computational assumptions, you can actually do better than log n. On the other end, and this is what makes this lower bound very strong, is that it works already for offline ORAM. What is an offline ORAM? It means that the entire logical sequence is known in advance. The compiler knows exactly what are going to be all the memory, um, the logical sequence, including the address that I'm going to access, and the actual data that I'm going to ask, okay? And even though I know all those things in advance, you can still not do better than log n over. Okay, so this is a very big advantage advantage of this log bound. Boyle and all, uh, first of all, uh, show that this is, um, this is um, the model of Goldach and Ostrovsky, they pointed it out. And in addition, they say that uh, if you achieve a better lower bound, a smaller lower bound than log n for offline ORAM that it's not in the balls and beans model, then you actually achieve uh, an n log n lower bound for sorting circuits. And this is a very hard problem in complexity that we don't really know how to, how to relate and, and what to do over there. So it's actually saying that if you can achieve a better lower bound for offline ORAM that doesn't suffer from statistical security, and bones and beans, you actually solve a very difficult problem in complexity. Then came uh, Larsen and Nielsen, and they showed uh, a lower bound of log n that doesn't work in the balls and beans model. It also works for uh, computational security. So it's in this sense complement Goldrich and Ostrowski, and it works for online ORAM and not for offline ORAM. Okay, so it really complements uh, Goldrich and Strzovsky. And uh, what I'm gonna show now, I'm gonna show the, the ideas behind this law. Okay, so the law bound of Larsen and Nielsen is based on the information transport technique of uh, Patresco and the main. Uh, it's in the cell probe model of uh, Yao from 81, which says that computation is free you only charge for, for probes, for actually accessing the memory. 
So let's look how the idea is behind this slogan. So think that you have the logical operations um, that the, 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 the program wants to, to perform. And under those logical operations, those logical operations, the ORM is going to translate them to some physical addresses that I'm going to access in the memory. So for simplicity, let's say that each logical operation is translated to Q physical probes in the memory. Now we are going to build a complete binary tree above those all uh, logical, logical operations, where the node, the leaves, are the actual logical operations. And um, we are going to charge some internal nodes of the physical probes that we are perf performing. Okay, so let's see exactly how we're going to charge. So we are going to assign each physical operation, which is going to be some read write of, of some specific address in the memory, an external memory. I'm going to assign it to this node if this node is the lower common ancestor of the two last physical accesses of, of that address. Let's see an example because it's really how to understand without an example. So let's say that those are the physical addresses that I have. So this, this one, some read or write from the logical memory was translated to accessing those specific location in the external memory. So I'm going to access 5, 10, 20, and 1. And let's say the 20 was visited again in this, in this uh, logical operation. Okay. So the co least common ancestor of 20, I see the 20 appears twice. I'm gonna charge 20 on this node, okay? And uh, let's say that the next time that we're going to ask 20 to, uh, to access the physical address on 20, it's going to be in this operation. So we, 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 um, the least common ancestor of 20, on those two accesses, it's actually the root. And for another example, uh, 44 is being accessed also over here. So I'm again gonna charge the roots from this access. Now, um, each physical probe, each physical probe that we have is going to be written at most one uh, internal node. Note that some probes, I don't even gonna write them down like five over here. If it was char if it was visited only once, I'm not gonna write it in any one of the nodes. So the total number of probes that the program uh, actually access, uh, if, if, we, if we count the sum of all values that we wrote on, on the entire tree, this is going to, to bound the total number of probes that we we have, okay? It is smaller than the total number of probes because some probes we don't charge in the tree. So it is enough to pound, um, to lower bound this, this bound, okay? I want to now count what are the sizes that I wrote on each one of the nodes, the sizes of the sets that I wrote. So, um, one important thing to, to say is that the adversary doesn't see the logical operations, but it does see the physical probes, and therefore it can also compute exactly the same tree, okay? So you can actually see and generate this uh, tree in his head. Now, um, based on the physical access pattern, the adversary can compute the tree, and for security, it means that no matter what the logical accesses we are doing, the tree, the number of elements in each one of those nodes supposed to be the same for every logical uh, sequence that we, that we have. So we are going to generate um, for each node, we are going to attack each node and force it to be very large. So we are going to compute some particular, we're going to generate some particular logical address, logical sequences for each one of the node that forces that node to be large. 
And because the tree is supposed to be the same, no matter, no matter what logical sequence we have, this means that, um, that uh, once we attack that node, it's supposed to be this size, no matter what logical, no matter what logical axes we have. Okay, so how do we attack the root? The idea is that we're going to write on this left, on this, uh, this subtree, we're going to write on memory location one, memory location two, memory location three, and so on, some random values, completely random values. And then on the other side, we're going to read that memory location. Now, the idea is that this must to be large because our client is small. It has a small number of registers. And we wrote a lot of information that is completely random. Because we wrote a lot of information that is random, it must be written to the memory. We cannot actually, for, from correctness, we cannot really uh, just save it in our local register. And from information te uh, transfer technique, from information uh, compressibility, we must have written it down to the memory. And then later, we must actually access those memory locations again. If we want to access this, if we want now to attack this particular node, again, we're going to have a sequence that is going to write random values over here and read those values over in, in, the, in the right subtree. And here we must have some, uh, again, information that moves from one, this subtree to that subtree, okay? So formally, we can write that for every node in depth D, the expected number of probes that are assigned to that particular node is n over two to the d. Okay, and this is essentially saying that it's the number of nodes or the number of leaves that we have in his uh, left subtree. And the proof is by encoding or compressing algorithm. Essentially saying that I cannot store this information locally. I must have written it to the to the to the external memory, and therefore later I must um, actually read it and and uh, and learn it again. Okay, so why what does it give us? So the expected number of total probes is, as we said, it's enough to sum over all vertices in the tree. So from linearity of expectation. We are going to have uh, this is supposed to be also greater than. Sorry, this is our claim, and um, this is over all the nodes in our tree. Now, each node we have two to the d nodes of depth d. Okay, so what we get, we get overall n log n uh, total number of probes, and we looked on programs that have logical sequences of length n. Okay, this was our uh, tree. We looked at a tree that has n leaves or two n leaves, which actually means that we must have log n overhead per, per operation, per logical operation in expectation. Okay, so uh, question, I have some references over here if someone wants to look at uh, this lower bound, other lower bounds, uh, there are many follow-ups some uh, relaxations of or um, maybe we don't really have want to have um, in this computational distinguishability when we, we just want to have differential privacy between uh, two programs that look ex look the same uh, so even that we, we cannot really do better maybe we don't care about a compiler we care about specific uh, specific uh, data structures we still have a lower bound for that and so on. So there are many uh, papers that are really built upon of this of this law. Uh, so this is a good time to stop and ask some que and ask questions. Uh, currently there are no questions. Okay. So um, I'm going to continue now with uh, tree-based ORMs, okay, at least provide some high-level idea of uh, tree-based ORM. Um, 
So those are simple constructions that actually achieve statistical security and achieve, at the end of the line, achieve log square n over. So our uh, starting point is uh, maybe we want to, you know, now we are trying to build an aura. Our starting point is, okay, let's just shuffle the memory. So I'm taking the internal memory. If uh, instead of saying this is address one, two and three and so on, I'm going to first shuffle everything and what the adversary is gonna see, the one who sees the, the memory, because everything is also encrypted, it doesn't see anything. And then when I'm accessing some, uh, some element, it has no idea what I'm accessing because everything is randomly shuffled. I access something, it's completely independent of what I'm actually, um, what I'm actually accessing. Okay, and then when I, maybe I access something else. The problem is of course, when I come to and do repeated query, when I want to access the same element one more time, I'm, try, I'm starting to reveal information. Okay, so, this leads us to the following design principle that blocks must be moved around the memory while we are operating, operating on our own. So the idea of tree-based theorem is the following. So we are going to arrange the memory in a tree where each node is going to be a bucket that actually can contain more than one element, maybe log n blocks in, in in the beginning. And let's assume for now uh, that we also have very large CPU size, okay? We can actually have many registers. And the idea of a uh, tree-based storm is to have the following path invariant. So every block is going to be mapped to one random path in the tree. And the client knows it holds the position maps that tells him block X, if you're looking for black X, block X, this is going to reside in this path, in path, path L. And, um, okay, so if I want to access a block X, I'm going to the position map, I see that it's on, uh, on, on this path, I'm gonna read the entire path. And uh, so read is, 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 uh, is simple, okay? I can read blocks very easily. Now I want to write it back. Now, maybe I want to just read it. Maybe I want to change the value. And uh, after being read, I'm, I cannot write it to the same place because then I didn't do anything, right? And at the same time, the next time I'm going to access the same node, you'll know that I'm accessing the same value like accessing the same address. So the block must be relocated. I'm going to write it in a different position. Now, let's say I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, sample a new path for that block. And uh, I want to move the element to reside on that path. Can I write it down on directly on the leaf of that? of that path? The answer is, is no, because then when I want to actually read it, you will know that this is the same block as I read next time, okay? So I cannot write it on the leaf. I can also not write it on each one of the internal nodes of, of the tree. The only place I can write it is actually the root of the tree, okay? So, so far, how, uh, read or write look like. I'm going to my position map. I'm going to see where the block is resides. I'm going to write that. I'm going to read this uh, path. I'm going to generate a new location. I'm going to generate a new um, sample, a new path for that block. And I'm going to write it only to the root while changing the position map and saying, now it's going to reside on the path L prime. Okay, um, so this is secure, very secure. All I'm accessing is just random path, paths along, along the tree. Okay, each access, I'm doing, just accessing something random, write it to the root and that's it. 
However, there is a problem. And the problem is that the root will overflow very fast. I said that each, each uh, block inside each node inside the tree is, uh, let's say, a bucket of log n uh, elements. So after log n accesses, the root is going to explode. We will have an overflow and we are screwed. So the idea is to have some back, back, background uh, procedure that evicts elements and pushes, um, pushes the blocks and propagate them around the tree. Okay, it's going to move the blocks around the tree to the place that they are actually supposed to go. This is going to be oblivious. We're going to do this eviction procedure obliviously. Uh, we don't want it to be too slow. Um, if we do it too slow, we're going to have overflows. And we don't want to do it also too fast, like we don't want to write down, after one read, write down the entire tree, because this will, it's like accessing the entire memory. We don't want to do it also too fast because we want to save cost. Okay, so one idea to do this eviction is at each one of the nodes, each one of the, on each, on each uh, level, to choose two random um, buckets. See exactly, you're gonna read them back to the memory, to the CPU. See exactly on each one of these uh, elements, there is written a path where it's supposed to go. And I'm gonna write it back into, into its kids, into the two children, uh, according to the path where it's supposed to go. So if, if I have here an element that's supposed to go at the end of the day to this, uh, to this location, I will write it to its, uh, this child. And if I have someone that's supposed to go to this location, then I'll write it to this, this child, okay? So at every level, I'm gonna choose two random elements, two random nodes, and I'm going to push its elements uh, downward. So everything is oblivious because I'm just choosing random uh, nodes, touch the two children of that node, and that's it. Okay, so I don't really reveal, uh, everything is random, it's not really revealed, and it happens in the background, it's independent to our actually accesses that we did in the beginning of the round. Okay, so it doesn't reveal information, and it was shown that uh, if the bucket size is log n, then, then there are no overflows with high probability. Okay, so each cost now is uh, log square n. Uh, we said we are gonna read the path and each node in the path has log n blocks. So this is log square n cost. What about the position now? So we said that the client has a lot of memory that he knows in advance, it knows internally where each element is located. Um, so we, we need to get rid of that position because it's uh, also something that we cannot store. It's too much, in, too much information on the client. So we are going to have a smaller position map. Um, so the position map, we can, we can group like two, two blocks together. And then we'll have a position map that instead of n elements, we're going to have only n over two. Now that position map, we again can store using another ORAM on the server. And then its position map will need only n over four blocks. That thing we can again store with an ORAM on the server, which we need a position map, which is only n over eight. Overall, we'll get log n position maps. So this is a, recursive um, position map to actually store the position map of the tree. Okay, so overall we got log cube n. So we got log square n from actually accessing the tree and another log n comes from the recursion of storing the position. So summary of tree-based theorems, uh, a block is remapped to a new random path uh, after we read it, the block must be relocated to the new path without revealing the new path. So this is when we write it down to the, to the uh, root of the tree. 
as the key challenge is to design eviction process and prove that there is no overflow. And actually, the, the eviction works. So general tree-based storm worked in the log cube. So again, we have three places where log comes from. Each path has log n nodes. Each node has a bucket of size log n. And a recursion of the position map adds us another log n. Now, path theorem, uh, which is an improvement, uh, reduced it to log square n. What they do is that they, they reduce the buckets on each, on each node in the tree to be just a constant size. However, this means that sometimes when you try to write something, you will not really succeed. Therefore, they also have an internal stash at the client that it can store polylog n elements. Okay, let's take a look at the code of, uh, of path theorem. So again, here I have a position. I'm gonna uh, see where, where I, I'm gonna read or write A. So I'm going to the position map and see what's location. I'm gonna write a new location to that uh, A. So I'm gonna get the uniform new value to A. And then I'm gonna read the buckets along the path. That's reading the buckets um, into the stash, into the internal uh, client. I'm going to, um, if I want to, to uh, read or write, I'm going to update the associated value of that block. And then when I see my, my path, I'm going to look at my, my internal, um, internal stash and I try to propagate as many elements as I can along that path. So what do I mean by that? Let's say that um, in my stash, I have an element in my internal memory, I have an element that wants to go over here and I read this, this path. So when I did that, I can, I can try uh, to write back the element into this node. Okay, because I'm reading the entire node, the entire path. And now I see that I have element that I can write back to the tree. So I can see the intersection and put it as, as deep as I can towards the leaves. So this thing apparently work and, and can work even for buckets of size uh, one. Okay, so um, with that, I want to conclude for today. Uh, tomorrow we're going to dis describe the hierarchical uh, ORAM scheme and see some new advances in uh, hierarchical ORAM. And if there are any questions, I'm really happy to, to take. Um, no questions from the audience. Okay. Okay. So I think we'll conclude for today. Thanks, Gila, for a great talk. And we have a lot Thank to look you. forward to tomorrow, going down, you know, from log squared to log n. Log n. Um, so I, I'd like to take this moment to thank again all the speakers of, of today. And we'll see all of you tomorrow for uh, Gila's next two talks. <laughs>